Today, you had the uh, Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, this year hosted by the United States, and Joe Biden was there. All, all, all the leaders of these uh, North, Central, and South American countries. However, Mexico's president boycotted the uh, summit. And here's why. At first, um, he said that he might come, but the United States did something that is so egregious, he said, I'm not coming. And uh, here's the headline from Democracy Now! It says, Mexico's president skips summit of the Americas after Biden bans Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. So yeah, you, you, you heard that correctly. Joe Biden banned America, so South and Central American countries. What do they have in common? They're socialist. He banned them from coming to the summit of the Americas. And you know the irony? Spain was invited. Spain, which is in Europe. This is very clearly and obviously political, and I want to show you Mexico's president. Take a look at what he had to say. Y no voy a la cumbre porque no se invita a todos los países de América. Y yo creo en la necesidad de cambiar la política que se ha venido imponiendo desde hace siglos, la eh, exclusión, el querer eh, dominar sin razón alguna el no respetar la soberanía de los países, la independencia de cada país. Y no puede haber cumbre de las Américas si no participan todos los países del continente americano. O puede haber, pero nosotros consideramos que eh, es seguir eh, con la vieja política de intervencionismo, de eh, falta de respeto a las naciones y a sus pueblos. Y no voy a... See, that's a president with a spine. That's somebody who has principles and who's not afraid to stand up for them. Um, here's the response from the White House. Okay? I mean, they, they really got some nerve. They really got some nerve. Take a look. We have had candid engagement with President Lopez Obrador as well with other regional partners for more than a month regarding the issue of invitations uh, to the summit. It is important to acknowledge that there are a range of views on this question in our hemisphere as there are in the United States. The president's principled position is that we do not believe that dictators should be invited, which is the reason um, that he has, um, the president has decided not to attend. <laughs> wow. Wow. You, did you hear that? said, we do not believe that dictators should be invited to attend. Wow. Maduro is a dictator now, huh? Really? What about Duque? Pretty sure he was invited. Huh? You don't have any comments about his uh, practices? Huh? They obviously... They obviously... Uh, prevented all these countries from coming because they all have something in common. They are anti-imperialist, they are leftist, socialist, and they are part of the global resistance. They are part of the global shift to a multipolar world. The president of Venezuela, Maduro, who the United States have been trying to overthrow, uh, 
now the U.S. is sending a delegation to beg him for oil. So at the same time, you're begging this guy to give you oil so, to lower oil prices so you can look good before the midterm elections. But then you're also, you know, basically kicking him out of a summit for the Americas. How the hell you have a summit of the Americas and you invite Spain, but you don't invite Venezuela and you don't invite Nicaragua and you don't invite Cuba, which is 90 miles away. What the hell is this? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man, the, the world is changing. And I can't say, no one can say whether the next um, era, the next age is going to be better than this one or worse than this one. But this current one, this cannot stay. This cannot stay, man. This bullying, intimidation, exclusion, vilifying, uh, you know, whoever you disagree with, this, this cannot stay. This cannot stay. Um, there can be no substantive discussion at any summit uh, of the Americas when you don't invite all the countries, right? Can you imagine if Venezuela was hosting? I have no doubt, despite everything that the United States has done, Venezuela would still invite the United States because they have, you know, common decency. They have a shred. I, I say they, they have a shred of dignity, uh, and much more, but they have, they have that common decency to invite you. And here the United States doesn't have a shred of dignity. The United States government, right? The people in charge at the State Department. I mean, it's disgusting. Cuba as well. Cuba's been under embargo 60 years. And I know that they would invite the United States regardless, out of respect, out of principle. Nicaragua, same thing. Oh, man. You guys... You well versed with the United States policies in Nicaragua? Policies, <laughs> putting it very mildly. Aggression, right? They have really attacked these countries. I, I want you to start thinking in terms of um, acts of war, right? That as sanctions are acts of war. If I come and I, you know, I turn off the electricity to your house, and all the food in your fridge goes bad and you can't eat. Or whether I come and I actually steal, I steal the food, I take it from you. Or I stop someone from delivering food to you. I stop you from being able to buy food. All of these lead to the same result. So, you know, whether you bomb a country and take out its infrastructure or you sanction a country and take out its infrastructure and people starve, it's no difference for the people that are targeted. So when you see the United States put sanctions on a country, that's an act of war. And it's illegal under international law. It's, it's unilateral. That would never hold up in an international court, right? So we were looking at a New York Times article just earlier about how the United States pur purposely crippled Venezuela's infrastructure and specifically the oil um, infrastructure. So even though Venezuela has all this wealth, the largest oil reserves, it can't export it because it won't be allowed to sell on global markets, and it can't refine it because the infrastructure is broken. So, broken, I'd say it, it was damaged on purpose. And even despite all this, Venezuela would invite the United States, e even despite the attempted coup, the Bay of Piglets, as it was called, and Cuba, despite the real Bay of Pigs. So do you see the difference? There's, there's a shred of decency, there's a shred of, um, you know, there, there's common sense there. There's common sense. And it's the same thing. Um, it's the same thing with the Blinken. Let, look, take a look at how this guy speaks. I mean, he just speaks in platitudes and a word salad. Nothing substantive at all. No other region in the world has the same direct impact on the lives and livelihoods of Americans than of the uh, hemisphere that we share. It's as simple as that. So to some extent, as goes the hemisphere, so go we. And so we have a real stake in making sure that together uh, we get this right. And again, to state the obvious, this is a time of incredible challenge for all of us. Uh, we've had a, a confluence of uh, almost perfect storm events over the last years that have had a profound effect here in the Americas. COVID, climate, um, some de democratic deficit, uh, migration, uh, and of course the daily and changing impact of technologies on the lives of, of everyone. 
You put all that together, we've lost 2.7 million lives yep. from COVID in our hemisphere. Uh, we, our hemisphere has suffered the most from COVID. Um, at the same time, it's 30% of global GDP. If we get our act together and mobilize that effectively, there is so much we can do. Wow. This, this guy, he's right. They lost a lot of people because of COVID. And in part, that's because of the United States. Cuba, despite the embargo, developed its own COVID-19 vaccine. Do you know what the United States did? The United States made sure they, they, they specifically tried to prevent Cuba from being able to buy syringes to deliver the vaccine. Here's, here's what the charge d'affaires had to say, right? Take a look. Not a single family in Cuba has not been affected by the blockade. Everyone has been affected because the blockade affects every dimension of the Cuban economy and society. And you have mentioned in your question the, the, the problems, the difficulties that Cuba has uh, in getting uh, supplies, medical supplies during the pandemic. And this has been as a result of the blockade. And I think that the most painful dimension of the blockade is the, the impact on the health situation, on the health system in Cuba. And another example of the health system and of the impact of these um, sanctions is that we in Cuba are deprived from uh, acquiring some uh, medicines only produced in the US uh, for the treatment of cancer, for example. Yes. And um, on the other hand, Cuba is also deprived from uh, the, 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 indus the national industry is deprived from to, to financing to import uh, yeah, inputs for the food production. You heard that. So there are cancer drugs only made in the U.S. Cuba is not allowed to have them, right? And I, I've seen and heard countless stories of people in Iran trying to get cancer medication. Nope, can't have it because of sanctions. You know, going from one pharmacy to the next. With, you know, tr th think about that. Think about how heartbreaking that is. You know, you got someone in your family suffering from cancer. And just because you come from Iran or you come from Cuba, the United States is literally fucking killing your uh, family member or your friend, or p even if you don't know them, people in the hospital. Equipment cannot be replaced. Sp uh, replacement parts can't be bought. This is evil, and this is an act of war. And I think it's really stunning that Blinken sits there as, you know, he is in a government, in the Biden administration, the that have had a which is continuing these policies, continuing the Trump's maximum pressure campaign. Found effect here in the America. The most important thing uh, besides this, listen to the first thing in his uh, sentence. No other region in the world has the same direct impact on the lives and livelihoods of Americans than uh, the uh, hemisphere that we share. That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, there is no question about it. And, you know, for, for example, Mexico... That's Mexico's president who refused uh, to come, right? And you look at the impact of, of trade. Canada is the United States' number one trading, par trading partner. Then Mexico. Mexico is the second largest trading partner. China is the third. Do you see how important these neighboring countries are for the United States? Why don't they just stick to them? Blinken himself is saying that this hemisphere affects us the most. Yes, it's true. So why are you in Syria? Why are you in Iraq? Why are you in Libya? Why are you in, you know, in, in Ukraine antagonizing Russia? Why all this destruction? Why can't you just stick to your region and mind your business? Some people, that they would call that isolationism. I don't care what you call it, really. It's, it's called mind your fucking business. That's the Medhurst doctrine, okay? Mind your fucking business and go home. Now, Mexico's president, Obrador, he said a month ago that he will boycott the summit if Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua are not invited. And keep in mind, he is still sending a representative, so somebody from his government would go, again, you see, like, out of respect, but he's not going. And, and he stood up for uh, his, uh, his neighbors and his uh, fellow Americans. You, you write this a lovely phrase the, <laughs> the U.S. likes to use. I'm reading the history of the summits. <laughs> it's good, right? I go all the... All these various summits, who, who hosted it, who was excluded. Look at this. Only at the 8th Summit of the Americas held in Peru in 2018 
did the Peruvian foreign ministry withdraw the invitation to Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro? Instead, an opposition delegation was invited. <laughs> How pathetic, man. Cuba was expelled from the Organization of American States, the OAS. That, that's the, the organization that, that's um, uh, hosting the Summit of the Americas, right? So Cuba was expelled from the OAS shortly after the 1959 revolution and the adoption of socialism as the system of government. This country under the regime, <laughs> regime, fuck you, this country under the, the leadership of the late Fidel Castro was represented at the Extraordinary Summit of 2002 held in Monterrey, Mexico. Do you see how they try to, like, delegitimize governments that they don't like? They call it a regime. Regime? Oh, okay. So S Saudi Arabia <laughs> is a lovely little rosy monarchy, right? Or um, a Saudi government, but never Saudi regime. Right? Or the Duque regime. I mean, just try to say that with Biden. Say, look how ridiculous it sounds. The Biden regime. Biden's regime forces. Da, da, da. Actually, maybe we should use their language so they get it. But my point is that um, the OAS, as you can see, they expelled Cuba. The OAS is an imperialist organization. It's an organization formed in the Cold War. And on the surface, it sounds like a great idea, right? The organization of the American states. We put all these... All these countries in the North, in, the, uh, in Central America and South America together. And there's unity and uh, coming together. Not really. In uh, 2019, when they could, they, 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 there was a fascist takeover against uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia. And I remember the videos, man. They trashed his house. His, several people in his family and his government, they had their houses trashed or burned. And they basically chased him out of the country and took the president, uh, sorry, took the presidency away from him. Disgusting, absolutely abhorrent, abysmal uh, behavior, you know? And that was done, of course, with the uh, supervision of the OAS. Because the, o the OAS said, okay, we'll come as independent observers and we'll count the... The results and, and you know, for, for the elections. And uh, they said there was fraud. Evo Morales committed fraud. And it's, he's desperately trying to cling onto power after his third, fourth term. And, you know, Morales had held a referendum with the people in um, Bolivia. Asking them if they want presidents to be able to have more terms, right? So basically to amend the constitution, uh, so to speak. And they said yes. And that's why he was able to run. And then once he ran, they accused him of fraud. They chased him out of the country. And you have these fascists who took over. And what happens then? The day of this coup, every fucking outlet you can imagine. The BBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post. All of them together, like a choir. Like an orchestra coming together. Evo Morales commits fraud in the elections. And they justify this. They, they create the music. The soundtrack to this violence. And then a year later, what happens? Say, oh, well, it turns out there was a miscalculation. A miscalculation? You fucking cooed this guy over a miscalculation? Oh, you miscalculated. No, you miscalculated. As a matter of fact, I, don't, I really don't like to make fun or something or laugh at other people's misfortune. But Janine Agnès, who became the quote-unquote interim president and took Morales' place, is on trial right now. And this is, this is what happens when you do the bidding of the Americans. The Americans will, le will, will leave you. They will leave you out to dry. Okay? Always. Always, always, always. Every, notice how every person or every country or every group that cooperates with the Americans always gets stabbed in the back. Always. Saddam Hussein, the Kurds, anyone, anyone, anyone. They always come after you. Or leave you, you know, again. Let others come, come and eat you. And so my point is here, I think it's really pathetic that we are in 2022 and we still have Cold War rhetoric and we still have childish, um, you know, rejection, exclusion, you know, um, of countries that have a different, you know, politics. Whether it's, I mean, again, you know, Venezuela doesn't agree with American politics, with the US, with US politics, I should say specifically. But they'd still invite the Americans, I'm pretty sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
my, you know, my experience, what I've seen is they don't behave like this. It's childish. And I, I cannot imagine in my wildest dreams Venezuela saying, for example, well, we no longer recognize the people in Washington. A bunch of Americans over here, they are the legitimate government and we invite them as the representatives of the U.S. What the, what, what is this? What is this childish behavior? So, unfortunately, again, we, what did I tell you when they changed the White House spokesperson, right? Because uh, this is uh, Karine Jean-Pierre. And before her, we had Jem Psaki, and they were saying, well, look, she's a woman of color. She's black. She's, you know, um, she's the first White House spokesperson who's black and queer, right? Um, okay, great. What about the policies? What about the way she handles business? I told you it's the same thing. You're just going to hear the same White House, Western, capitalist, white supremacist propaganda, but coming out of a different mouth. But the politics are the same. You know, Trump goes, Biden comes, politics are the same. It's always uh, important to realize that the countries pointing fingers and saying, oh, you're a regime, are themselves the, the biggest and most continuous regimes. How is it possible that the Americans, the, the United Statesians, are still behaving like it's the Cold War? They're, you know, with this childish, um, oh, you know, you're a socialist, you're a communist, we, we can't be seen dealing with you don't come don't come here you're not invited what is that hmm? still stuck in the cold war good on mexico's president for standing up good on him